What true crime case haunts you? The Boy in the Box On February 25, 1957, the body of a four- to six-year-old boy was found stuffed in the bassinet box and dumped in the fox chase section of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The child's body was recently washed, covered in bruises and lacerations, and his hair was recently cut. He was naked, wrapped in a tattered plaid blanket, and clumps of the recently cut hair were still clinging to his upper torso, blanket, and the box in which he was found. The child had surgical scars along his groin and ankle as well as an L-shaped scar on his chin. He was malnourished and showed signs of significant abuse prior to death. He was originally located by John Statuick, a man illegally trapping muskrats. John did not report the discovery, fearing police would confiscate his traps. Several days later, college student Frank Guthrum discovered the child's body and reported it to authorities. Police took the child's fingerprints. However, they yielded no match. Over 270 police cadets combed the crime scene and found potential clues in a child's scarf, a man's blue corduroy hat, and a man's white handkerchief with the letter G on it. However, these clues did not lead to new information in the case. Investigators believe the child may have been the unwanted child of the unwed stepdaughter of a man that ran a local foster home. Blankets similar to the one found with the child as well as a bassinet matching the one from the box he was found in were located in the foster home. However, no further evidence was collected and no charges were pursued. In February of 2002, a woman named Martha, or M, came forward stating the child was purchased by her abusive mother from his birth parents in the summer of 1954. During the next two years, her mother allegedly physically and sexually assaulted the child until one evening at dinner when he vomited his meal, which contained baked beans. M's mother dragged the child to the bathroom, where she beat him and slammed his head into the floor before drowning him in a cold bath. She cut his hair, stuffed him in a box, and disposed of the body. The details of Martha's story matched details that were not released to the public, including that the child's stomach contents contained beans, and he had water, wrinkled hands, as well as several noted injuries in specific locations on the child's body. Despite this, Martha was not taken seriously and dismissed as she allegedly had a history of mental illness. Neighbors of Martha's mother declined ever seeing a boy at the household and the tip was officially discredited. Other theories were investigated, but subsequently also dismissed. In 2016, a facial reconstruction of the child was created and released, but yielded no leads. In 2017, DNA from the child was tested against a man from Memphis, but was unfortunately not a match. The boy in the box was originally buried in Potter's Field. However, after his exhumation in 1998 for DNA extraction, he was reburied in Ivy Hill Cemetery in Cedarbrook, Philadelphia. His headstone reads, America's Unknown Child. City residents regularly place stuffed animals and flowers at his grave. It's been nearly 64 years since the boy in the box was discovered. Who was he? Who killed him? Could Martha have been correct about his identity? Will America's Unknown Child ever get his name back? The fact that Larry Murphy is walking around free makes my blood run cold and that of any women who are aware of who he is. For some reason, I can't lick the wiki page, but if you wiki Larry Murphy criminal, it'll take you straight to his page. He is a convicted rapist and prime suspect in the disappearance of a number of young women in the 90s, including an American visitor, Annie McCarrick, the first to go missing, which he was in prison for the rape, the disappearances stopped. In 2001, he kidnapped a woman, locked her in the trunk of his car, and drove to a secondary location where he repeatedly raped and beat her. He put her back in the trunk of his car and drove to an isolated area in the mountains where he began repeatedly raped her and beat her. He was in the process of attempting to murder her when two hunters, by the grace of the heavens, happened upon them. They recognized him as he lived in the locality. He ran off and they took the woman to safety and reported it to the police. Larry Murphy was arrested and pleaded guilty to rape and attempted murder. He served a paltry 10 years in prison. He showed no remorse for his crime. While in prison, he refused to engage with rehabilitation programs, and when he was released, he was just as dangerous as the day he was arrested. In the 90s, Ireland was rocked by the disappearance of a number of young women, eight in total, all within a similar geographical area, and all within Larry Murphy's reach. All of these disappearances have been thoroughly investigated, but no trace of the women have ever been found. Larry Murphy has been ruled out as a suspect in just one of these disappearances as the other seven remain unsolved. It is widely believed 
that they met their fate that he intended that women to meet in 2001, the one the hunters saved. It's suspected their bodies are buried in the Dublin Wicklow Mountains and it's a vast area. It's wild terrain and nothing has turned up yet. The disappearances stopped while he was in prison. When he was released from prison, he was hunted by the media and he couldn't settle anywhere in Ireland, so he moved on to mainland Europe. He has lived in Spain, France, and the Netherlands. Irish police work with the police in these countries so they know who he is. He's been spotted trying to chat up young women in bars and visiting prostitutes. The police keep him under surveillance. Last known location was in the south of Spain, where he was working as a carpenter under an alias. It just runs my blood cold. Killing of Rene Hartvelt by Issei Sagawa That man not only had intercourse with his victim, but ate her and kept her body parts in the fridge. He had multiple cases and his psychopathic thoughts absolutely haunts me. Hard to believe he was only declared sane and found that perversion was his sole motivation for murder. He's currently living a long life at 71 years old. There wasn't much punishment for him. He just wrote books about his murders. The Andrea Yates case just the mental image of those poor children trying to get away as she was drowning their siblings. Also, the image of her husband keeping her constantly pregnant despite knowing she had mental health issues. He was quoted at one point as saying that he wanted to have more children with her after she was treated and released. If you haven't read it, the book Are You There Alone is absolutely heartbreaking. The Otaku Killer The way he lured those small girls and killed them makes my blood boil. Thank God he was put on death row. For context, he was a child rapist and he would kill the children, strip them bare and take photos. Afterwards, he would have intercourse with their dead bodies for days on end before they began to rot. He would amputate their legs and arms too as trophies. He was caught, trying to lure another young girl. He got photos, but another girl saw and told her father. Her father beat the shit out of the creep and he called the cops. The Rat Man, one of his other nicknames because of his hands, tried to run, but the police were at his car. He was arrested, and his face was shown to the world. My sister was murdered in 1984, and it's a cold case now. The most likely hypothesis was that she was killed because she was threatening to sue a dentist with ties to organized crime. He botched an oral surgery on her and tried to pay her off not to report him, but she refused. The police said a suspected hitman flew into town the day before she was killed and left afterwards but there was no evidence left. She was stabbed five times in the torso after returning home to her apartment from work. Several hundred dollars in cash were in plain view of the dining table. Alone, she was giving her husband's cousin, and nothing was missing. I'll probably never know who did it, and the killer could be dead by now, and this happened in 1984. Jack the Ripper I was really interested in history as a kid, got a book from the library's history section about the case without knowing anything about it. Why my parents or the librarian let a child check the book out, I have no clue. It had pictures, lots of them. The image of Mary Kelly is forever burned into my retinas. It gave me nightmares for years, still horrified by it today. Joseph D'Angelo, the Golden State Killer. The way he would stalk his victims for weeks and sneak in and out of their houses without anyone knowing and hide weapons around the victim's house and his victims had no idea. It just freaks me out to no end. Glad he was finally caught, but it took way too long. He took and ruined so many lives and then got to live the vast majority of his outside of prison. I'm not religious, but I hope hell exists for fucking garbage like him and I hope he has a long, miserable life of rotting in jail. The Matthew Hoffman Case, Not the Actor For those who don't know, Hoffman was responsible for the deaths of Stephanie Sprang, Tina Maynard, and Tina Sung Cody in November of 2010. After breaking into their house and stabbing them to death, he dismembered them, put them into garbage bags, and stuffed them inside a hollow birch tree. He also abducted and sexually assaulted Tina's daughter, Sarah Maynard, keeping her imprisoned in his basement for four days. Hoffman had a minor criminal history and mostly kept to himself. When police identified him as a potential suspect and entered his home, nearly every surface was absolutely covered with leaves. There were leaves piled roughly three feet deep on the floor, bags of leaves stacked against almost every wall. Sarah was kept on a makeshift bed of leaves in the basement. What sticks with me about this case is Matthew's attitude toward everything. He says he experienced psychosis episodes, one would assume psychopathy because of his attitude toward his victims. 
but he loved trees. He begged law enforcement not to cut down the tree he had stowed the bodies in. He just always loved trees. It's odd to see one show no empathy for human life or dignity, including one's own, and yet trees? I don't know. He haunts me a lot. Sword and Scale has an amazing episode on this case if you want to know more. Robert Eric Wohn Blows my mind that they couldn't solve it with so much odd evidence. He stayed at a friend's house while in a work trip and was stabbed to death after being sexually assaulted. The three men in the house were in a homosexual polyamorous relationship. They all claimed it must have been an intruder and were eventually acquitted. Tyler Hadley killing his parents, hiding the bodies and throwing a weekend long party. The picture of him standing next to his buddy says a lot. The fear and the panic in his eyes, not to mention probably high as balls. I hope that motherfucker gets taken good care of in prison. God, I wish they didn't release the pictures of the absolutely trashed bedrooms. The bank came and took the house, so it's been demolished. Also, the 1978 Holiday Inn fire killed 10 people, some of which were visiting from Canada. Yes, they've declared it arson, but over 42 years later, they never found who did it or why. The off-duty police officer that first reported it, kind of a suspect in my eyes though. Whoever set the fire didn't want it to be seen from the main road. I live about five minutes away from the site, which is now Red Lobster, and another hotel. No memorial set up in the parking lot or anything. Not necessarily the case that fucks me up the most, but I haven't seen John List mentioned here, and I think about that one a lot. The guy murdered his whole family, his wife, his kids, his elderly mom, and then started a new life, which he lived for decades. He remarried and had a normal life where no one suspected anything at all, and he was only caught because America's Most Wanted showed a forensic model that some neighbors recognized as him. Imagine your coworker or neighbor or second husband secretly did something like that. The case that fucks me up the most is the toy box killer. I have a super specific phobia of something like that happening to me. So when I heard that someone not only did it, but the victims often were drugged to the point of amnesia, I freaked out. Like, what if I just don't remember that happening? Not one of the world's known crimes, my sister in her teens was attacked on the way home by a mysterious man about 10 years ago. She managed to escape from him. Mom called the police when sister came home and told my mom everything. No one caught that man and we never got to know who was that man and what they wanted to do with my sister, thank God. Now, I always walk fast by that street where she was attacked and I always look behind my shoulder. That scare will haunt me all my life. It's not a scary crime, but a man called Lel Hildebrand disappeared from a rock club in Salvesborg, a couple of towns over from where I grew up. It was early 1999, and Hildebrand was tour leader for the band Hammerfall. He, and a briefcase with money, simply vanished from the gig. He still hasn't been found. What happened is pretty straightforward. A feud over money went bad. The question that haunts me is where the body is. Then, of course, the Palm murder. He was shot the night my mother turned 20, and is a bit of a national trauma. 2. The brother of a childhood friend disappeared one night. His car was later found an hour away, completely wiped down with chemicals that destroyed evidence. After a few years, someone came forward saying their boyfriend was bragging about a murder. The guy was arrested and put on trial and found guilty. We've never found the body, and based on where they found the car, there had to be an accomplice at least after the fact who picked up the murderer. And. The other involves two incidents, one solved, featured on BuzzFeed Unsolved and made into a movie, and the other unsolved to this day. Around 1926, a boy named Sanford Clark, who lived in Saskatoon in Canada, was brought down to work on his uncle's farm in Winneville, California. Instead, the uncle molested and beat him and forced him to help cover up murders of possibly 20 other boys the uncle would abduct and molest. The murders were discovered during the search for a Walter Collins who went missing and the police were so overzealous at returning the boy to his mother that they unknowingly or more likely knowingly gave her another boy instead who pretended to be Walter. The mother was so adamant that he wasn't her son that the cops sent her to a mental asylum for a while before the kid confessed he wasn't Walter. In the search, they discovered the farm, the uncle had skipped town, and Sanford Clark who became their store witness. The uncle was captured in Canada, brought back put on trial and eventually hanged. Sanford Clark was eventually returned to his mother and lived out his life back in Saskatoon, having a family and eventually passing away in 1991. 
Sanford's son wrote a book about Sanford's ordeal and piecing his life back together in Saskatoon, called The Road Out of Hell. The other half of this is Alexandra Waworchuk, a nurse at the city hospital who lived nearby in a basement apartment with friends who were fellow nurses. One night, in 1962, she went for a walk and never came back. She was missing for a week before someone discovered her body mostly buried along the shore of the river that runs through the city, 800 yards or less than a dozen blocks from home. The police came up with two dozen suspects, but no arrest. The nieces of Alexandra have kept the investigation alive to this day, narrowing down to four possible suspects they have not named. In Alexandra's obit, they list her residential address, an apartment building on 7th Avenue. Just out of curiosity, I looked in a Henderson, aka Reverse, directory from 1962 and found Sanford Clark living on 6th Avenue. They were next-door neighbors across the alley from each other. The Oklahoma Girl Scout Murders The girls, Lori Lee Farmer, Doris Denise Milner, and Michelle Heather Gus, were between the ages of 8 and 10 and had been raped, bludgeoned, and strangled. It happened during a thunderstorm, and they had been in the tent furthest from the camp counselors. No one heard or noticed anything. Additionally, the tent was partially obscured by the showers. The worst part is that, less than two months before the murders, during an on-site training session, a camp counselor discovered a disturbing handwritten note in her belongings. It said, We are on a mission to kill three girls in tent one. The director of the camp session treated the note as a prank, and it was thrown away. The Junko Furuta Case November 1988 to January 1989 17-year-old Japanese high schooler Junko Furuta was abducted, raped, beaten up, tortured, and killed by some delinquent boys around her age because one of these boys had a crush on her and she rejected him. After she died, they put her body in a concrete block and dumped it into a lake, I think. It was horrifying to read that for the first time. I learned about it through an app that sent you true crime cases every day, and it disturbed me so much I deleted the app not long after. 